Grand Ayatollah Khomeini, the architect and the face of the Iranian revolution. They should obey because this is an Islamic and legitimate government. One thing that was attractive about him is that he wasn't after power. He wanted to serve the people of Iran. But rarely in modern history has a man who did not seek power come to wield so much of it. Overall, he took pleasure in seeking power. We should have known better. Grand Ayatollah Khomeini, a leading religious scholar, became the spiritual leader of the Iranian revolution. The revolution would have a wide-ranging impact on the region and would herald an era of defiance and conflicts between Iran and the West, one that continues to this day. For such an iconic figure, little is known about the early life of Ruhollah Mosavi Khomeini. He was born in 1902, it's believed, in the north-central town of Khomein, into a family with a long tradition of religious scholarship. A tradition that would continue. He proved to be a prodigious pupil, especially in areas of Islamic law. He was a star student to the foremost ayatollahs of the day in the leading seminaries in the holy city of Qum, which remains to this day the center of Shia religious learning a world far removed from that of Iran's royal family. Imam Khomeini, as a scholar, had a special place in the religious school of Qum, especially in areas of Sharia laws and jurisprudence, in addition to philosophy and mysticism. Having this position, he was thoroughly anti-Pahlavi royal family regime. In terms of knowledge and morality, he was at a very high level, and he was not after either position or worldly possessions. He had only God in his mind, and whoever lives this way, God will help. From the outset, Khomeini was drawn to the relationship between politics and religion, in particular, the role of the clergy in politics. In his 20s, he would develop his theory of veliyat faqih the guardianship of juris consul, or clerical authority something that would become a central tenet in the establishment of the Islamic Republic. In his talks with religious scholars and leaders, he raised the issue of saving Iran and saving Islam. He saw that we needed to overthrow the Pahlavi dynasty. Khomeini became a lecturer at religious seminaries in Qum and in Najaf in Iraq, two of Shia Islam's most important cities teaching political philosophy and Islamic history and ethics. And his hostility to the Shah's reign began to receive wider attention. He became the main speaker of the opposition inside Iran, and he gained the ground for what he was doing, because correctly he was continuously attacking the Shah's brutality. Because of that, he gained the popular support of the people. In 1963, the Shah instituted wide-ranging reforms. The so-called White Revolution changed the laws on land ownership and gave women the right to vote. In another move that inflamed his critics, American military personnel living in Iran were granted freedom from prosecution. For Ayatollah Khomeini, this was unbearable. His criticism of the Shah's lavish lifestyle and infamous brutality had been muted compared to his condemnation of the new reforms. Khomeini replied to the Shah's announcement saying that as far as we know, men are not free to vote, since when are women free to vote? As well, he made a sharp attack against the Shah himself, saying that if he did not change his ways, the day would come when the people would offer up thanks for his departure from the country. It was a measure of Khomeini's following that his comments led to an uprising in Qum in June of 1963. He was arrested and soon exiled. After a two-year stay in Turkey, he returned to Najaf in Iraq, where he had pursued his religious studies years earlier. He continued his sermons as well as his attacks on the Shah. Forced exile did not silence nor subdue him. <laughs> His program in Najaf was a simple and ordinary one. 
He was teaching and continuing the struggle. His speeches had a great impact on people. Exile empowered Khomeini even further. He now enjoyed the complete freedom to express his dislike of the Shah and his policies. He presided over a complex network of followers who would carry tape recordings of his writings and speeches back to Iran, where they were repeated and distributed in mosques throughout the country. Khomeini was becoming the voice of opposition to Iran's ruling elite. He was physically in Najaf, but through friends and foreign media, he would get information about the situation here. No one in the close circle would do anything without his permission. His knowledge was so acute that he knew details of what was going on here that even Iranians didn't know. Here was a man that, who is in the position, can challenge you very effectively. The political wisdom was telling me that I have to cooperate with him. The quality which made Khomeini the central unifying figure and symbol of the Islamic Revolution was that he was seen by all anti-Shah forces as a humble and above all honest man with no ambitions for himself. After reading his writings, uh, I came into his presence and I felt myself um, before one who, in whom there was no gap between word and deed, between thought and action. Khomeini was becoming the public face of opposition to the Iranian royal family. To the outside world, he was the stern, unbending critic of the Shah's regime. But little is known about his private life. By the time of his exile in 1963, he was already 62 years old and the father of seven children, though only five survived through infancy. He also had 15 grandchildren, his immediate family saw a very different side of Ayatollah Khomeini. I can dare say that he was the best grandfather in the world. Maybe in the world of politics, he was very senior and powerful. But when he came back home, we would forget that he was the imam with all that power and that he shook the world. All the children, small and big ones, loved him. Not because he was the imam or the leader of the country, but because of his kindness and sensitivities. His children and the grandchildren all loved him, a very kind and gentle person. Khomeini's public resistance to women's rights was also quite different to how he treated them in private. He loved his granddaughters most of all. He himself was very chic and well-dressed. He would say to us, women are so smart, they take all the good things for themselves. You could smell his perfume from 10 meters away. He usually wore woman's perfume. As Khomeini's influence and following swelled inside Iran, authorities in Tehran were also on the scent and wanted to stop him. But the only thing the Shah's government could do was to ask Saddam Hussein to silence Khomeini from his exile in Najaf. It worked, and in October of 1978, Khomeini once again found himself without a country. He was soon to find sanctuary in Europe. It was an unlikely refuge for such a religious leader. I proposed to him that we should go to Paris. First, he didn't agree. Because it was very, it was very heavy idea for a high mujtahid, a reverend uh, in his caliber to go to Paris, such a romantic city. Uh, somehow we were also concerned what the reactionary clergy will react to his trip to Paris. He said, okay, we go to Paris. Of course, there was some good reason that we chose Paris. What happened? All of a sudden, the movement became internationalized. Neuf Le Chateau became the new nerve center of Khomeini's team and the Ayatollah's temporary home. I was responsible during those few months in Nofle Chateau in uh, all press conferences and uh, interviews of Ayatollah Khomeini, I mean the journalists, the translation and everything. Another responsibility uh, of mine was looking at to more than 20 newspapers, journals every day looking for the news and I prepared a news briefing every night for Ayatollah Khomeini. It was here, just outside one of Europe's most glamorous and historic cities, 
that the final plans for the Iranian revolution were being drawn for what Khomeini believed to have been his and Iran's destiny.